Welcome everyone to Study Tank. Study Tank is a virtual initiative put on by Tech Tank where we gather to discuss around uh, technical concepts uh, related to web technologies. This includes, but is not limited to data structures and algorithms, web fundamentals, and anything really related to the web. Part of this initiative is the Community Educators Program, which invites members from the community to come on and teach about the topic that they're passionate about. Tonight, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics related to web, web accessibility. And we have Hyojan, who is going to be talking to us all about web accessibility. So without further ado, let's have Hyojan come on and um, introduce himself and uh, get us kicked off with web accessibility. All right. Thank you, Nanso. All right. So... Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hojo. So today, um, uh, I'll be talking about web accessibility. Uh, this will be more for, uh, those who are new to accessibility. So I'll be going over what it is, um, uh, and what guidelines and laws that we have. And then at the end, um, uh, I have a a quick demo to show you what difference the web accessibility makes to, uh, users with disabilities. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. So, okay, my name is Hojo. Uh, I'm the accessibility lead at at my at the uh, web services team at Toronto District School Board. Um, I do some web development on the job as well, but uh, I mainly focus on um, accessibility uh, fixes on on our site. Um, my favorite catchphrase, I guess, if you can call it, is like, I don't know, let me look that up, right? Uh, because um, no matter how long you've been doing doing the accessibility, there's always something uh, new that comes up. So it, it's kind of impossible to know everything. Um, so yeah, so I'm also, I also have a certification from IAAP as a web accessibility specialist. Um, again, despite the fact that I have that certification, I still have lots to learn. Right? So to, it's going to be more about me sharing what I've learned over the years instead of teaching what it is. Uh, so what's an accessibility, what's the web accessibility? Right? So the definition of web accessibility is, is that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. And this is actually defined by W3C. Kind of a mouthful, um, but not wrong. But I like to define it a little bit different. And I like to define it as creating a curb cuts in the digital environment. So, uh, so the curb cut is, is, is referring to the curb cut effect um, for those who are not familiar with what curb cut effect is, um, it refers to when we design for disabilities, we make things better for everyone. Right. So on the slide here, I have a, a illustration of of the illustration that describes what curb cut effect is, and the illustration have a a sidewalk with the curb cut uh, that's highlighted in red, and we have um of people in various um people we have a various uh types of people uh, on or near the sidewalk right so we have people using bicycles uh person on a wheelchair a uh, person pushing a dolly with a stack of boxes right so the curb cut was originally designed to help uh people on wheelchairs but turns out it benefited everyone right so that's what that's what the curb cut effect is and that's kind of how I like to define what what uh, accessibility is. So to understand web accessibility or uh, to start with accessibility, we kind of have to know the type, different types of disabilities that are um, uh, that are present and the types of barriers that are created by those uh, disabilities. So 
for types of disabilities, we have uh, a visual disability, right? Uh, we have auditory, physical, uh, cognitive, learning, or uh, neurological. And we have a speech disability. Right? And the types of barriers that are created by these are percep perception, um, operation, and understanding related barriers, right? The perception is anything that you perceive, so anything you can, um, you see, or I guess for the users who are on assistive technologies, um, how they can perceive the content through the um, assistive technology. And the operation is how users can use your website or your application. Again, it could be with or without um, assistive, assist, assistive technology, and the understand understanding is, um, can people actually understand your site, right? Not in terms of what the content, but in terms of structure, um, how and in case of, um, the application, like web applications, can they figure out how to use your application? without needing a documentation or a instruction, right? So again, that is uh, with and without the assistive technology. So one of the biggest mistakes when we talk about web accessibility is we tend to think about disabilities that are like permanent disability, right? So on the slide here, I have a diagram that shows the permanent temporary and situational disabilities that affects your movement, uh, your sight, hearing, speech, and cognition. Right? So uh, as you can see, it's not always about permanent disability, right? It, it, you, the disability comes in many different forms. Um, fun fact, I am actually suffering temporary disability with the throat infection. I actually walk up with a sore throat, so um, I sound a little rough today and have a bit of a hard time speaking, but, um, yeah. Right. And if, if you guys ever, if you guys were ever in a situation where you're outside using a phone under the sun and you can't see on the screen, that would be a situational disability that affects your sight. Right. Um, so a more realistic example, to give you a more real, realistic example, is if you're in a library and you forgot to bring your headset or your phone, um, so you cannot watch a, a video, like a Udemy video. So only way to watch the video is through a caption. If, the, if they didn't have a caption, you wouldn't be able to understand what the, what the instructor is saying because you won't be able to play the sound through the speaker in the library, right? So, so having a caption is part of, or one of the accessibility features um, that you can add to your um, the digital content. So, uh, so having seen, having, so having seen this, uh, different types of disabilities and the uh, then different forms it comes in. We can actually say that disability is really not about a condition that someone has, but it's actually a mismatch of mismatch of one's abilities and their environment. Right. Uh, so how do people with disabilities actually use the web? Right. So how um and they they will need obviously they will need the assistive technology some type of assistive technology to help them use the uh, web whether it's a website or web application and uh, you will you will see um, a lot of people using screen reader um, there are people who use screen magnifiers or they just use the simple uh, the zoom function on your browser that you can with the control plus. Um, there are switch devices. Right? So switch device is a form of alternative input device. It's usually made up of two or three, a few buttons 
um, and it kind of helps you to it it mimics your some of your keyboard um, functions and some of and some of your mouse functions. So you can do left click, right click. Um, you can scroll up and down the page, and things, and you can uh, tap through uh, the buttons and links, things like that. And then we have a Braille. So Braille is used along, usually used uh, along with the screen reader. So screen reader by default, it will uh, speak out uh, wherever the user is currently focused on. But when it's used with the Braille, instead of speaking it out, it will, um, it will, it will output it in to the Braille device. So you just can actually read the Braille to understand um, or to quote unquote read the content on the site. And then there's a voice recognition, right? So if you are um, paralyzed, right, for uh, due to a disease or injury, uh, uh, the only way you can interact with the uh with the uh the site or the application is by saying out the command right so you can say things like open chrome and then um it will open up a chrome go to google or you say type in google.ca it will type in google.ca and you navigate to google and so it will consider click uh search and it will Click a search button and etc. So uh, there's the voice recognition uh, that people also use. So um, we have guidelines, right? And like everything else, we need a guideline to tell us, you know, how to make things accessible. And the two main guidelines as a developer uh, you will need to know is the uh, web content accessibility guidelines and Web Accessibility Initiative, um, Accessible Rich Internet Application. Uh, so WCAG and your uh, Y area, right? Um, if you're not, if you don't know what what ARIA is, ARIA is an um, additional attribute that you add onto your HTML elements, um, and what that does, it provides more information to the assistive technologies, what this element is about or what this content, what this content is about and how user can interact with it, right? Um, fun fact, first rule of ARIA is do not use ARIA, right? <laughs> um, it's because with the, H with the introduction of HTML5, um, a lot of HTML, HTML5 elements are now quite accessible out of the box. So um, it's really not that common that you need uh, the you need to add more ARIA attributes. It, the ARIA attributes comes into play where you're creating a custom um, components, right? So for example, let's say uh, we see like an image carousel on, on many websites. To make that accessible, you will need certain uh, ARIA attributes added to your uh, HTML elements so that it can be interacted uh, with the uh, with the assistive technology, right? Things like a, a screen reader. So I'm not gonna go over ARIA in detail, but uh, we're gonna take a quick look at the WCG. Guideline. Uh, so the WCG has four principles. Uh, it has perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Right. So we saw the first three uh, before in the types of barriers. Um, the robust is about how compatible your site or application is. Right. So does it work on other browsers? Right. So or does it work? Uh, with the assistive technologies. And uh, many years down the road, you know, um, let's say uh, a Chrome 
has gone through multiple um, updates over the next uh, six months, is your site or is your application still working uh, properly with the new version of the uh, Chrome browser? Chrome browser. So that's what robust is about. Um, so this, uh, so WCH has thirteen guidelines, and each guideline has uh multiple success criteria, uh, and there are three levels: um, single A, double A, and triple uh, triple A. Uh, the single A is, um, I don't I don't want to say easiest, but it's like it's like a mandatory, right? So you need to have single A. Um, you need to be single A compliant at the very least, and triple A is like going that extra mile, right? So it's not necessarily needed, but it will be uh good to have. The triple A compliance, right. um, and double A is that fine balance in the middle. Um, that's why you will see a lot of um, companies or even some uh, laws uh, referring to double A as the uh, the minimum uh, requirement right, for your site or application to be considered as um, accessible. Um, so since its uh, intro introduction in 2008, um, there has been two updates to the WCAG, and most recent update was uh, last month in October, uh, where they introduced nine new success criteria. Right. So one of the success one of the new success criteria that was introduced with the uh, 2.2 version is the target size. All right, so the target size is about the minimum size of your button it has to be, right? And I believe, I believe it was um, forty-eight pixel by forty-eight pixel. Um, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the exact number. But now there is a a, a specific size that your button needs to be. Right, there's a minimum size it needs to be, and you know it's got, it's got all other um, it also has like other situations where it where it says you know, it doesn't have to be that size you know under certain circumstances. So it has like some exceptions, but generally that's the minimum size now. Um, so with the guidelines, we need law, right? Because without the law. Um, who's to say which guideline, uh, how to make the, how, you know, we can really say uh, which guideline to follow, right? So we have a law telling us that, you know, you need to be um, compliant with this guideline and um, how much of this guide, uh, how much of the guideline. So, in Canada, we have um, Accessible Canada Act, that's like Canada-wide. And in Ontario, we have Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, right? Also known as AODA. Uh, you might have heard it uh, here and there. And in states, they have the <clears throat> American Disability Act and Section 508. Um, and then other parts of the country, like in Europe, they have uh, their own uh, European Accessibility Act. And in South Korea, they have a, a base act on intelligent information. Right? So different laws, but in the end, they uh, are generally talking about the same thing. Right? So your site needs to be accessible. And for, uh, for it to be considered um, to be accessible, it has to follow certain guidelines to a certain extent, right? So in Ontario, the AODA actually says designated public sector organ sector organization or businesses or nonprofit organizations with fifty or more employees, you need to be access your site or your um application needs to be accessible. And it says you only need to be accessible. You only need to meet 
uh, WCG 2.0 level double A compliance for uh, uh, for it to be considered as accessible, right? So that's your minimum legal requirement to say uh, to to say that your site or your application is accessible, and it actually gives an exception with the uh, live captions and pre recorded audio descriptions. I'm not sure why those are exceptions, <clears throat> uh, but apparently that is. I don't agree, but that's what law says. But despite what the law says, um, I always tell people, keep up with the current ver current version of the guidelines. Right? So even though AODS says, yeah, you only need to be in compliance with 2.0, but um, if you actually only uh follow the 2.0 um 2.0 guide uh 2.0 uh success criteria you're actually uh, leaving some of your content <clears throat> still not being accessible right because with the uh with the new version so 2.1 and 2.2 uh, with with those new versions they introduce more success criteria to cover more um, situations and more contents that were uh, that were kind of missed before. So the newer version of the guideline covers more range of situations and more range of contents uh, and how to make them more accessible. Right. So always keep up with the current version. The law is only giving you a, a minimum requirement, but that's not always the best, uh, that's not always the best for the actual users. So as a developer, <clears throat> we need to know uh, how to make things accessible, right? And then the first thing that we, uh, we need to know or or the uh the first place to where we start is writing a a good HTML or writing a good markup. So <clears throat> you need to be you need to be using a semantic HTML, right? Uh, if you haven't heard what uh if you haven't heard the term semantic HTML and you don't know what it is, it's uh just referring it pretty much refers to HTML elements that has a meaning. Right, so it doesn't have a meaning to us, uh, but they have a meaning to assistive technology. Right? Um, <clears throat> so one category of semantic HTML is landmarks. So landmark is just uh, sections on your page. So like your header area where you have the menu, uh, usually at the top, uh, the footer that you have at the bottom of the page <clears throat> and your uh, navigation menu, right? Uh, those are some examples of uh, landmark, right? So you have a header element, you have a main, you have a, uh, a side, a footer, nav, and you also have a section, but section is only a landmark if it has a label. Right? So without the label, Section is really not considered as a, a landmark. Um, and then when, <clears throat> and then we get into controls, right? The user control or things like a button, and uh, your anchor tag for the links. Um, the one thing I want to point out here with the button uh, and the links is you have to use them correctly. They have their own purpose. Uh, and their own usage, right? <clears throat> so, uh, generally, generally speaking, the rule of thumb of button is to do something, right? It, it, it's a it's a um, action trigger, right? So things like opening uh, uh, a menu, right? Or, or deleting, editing, right? That type of stuff, that's a button. Link is for going somewhere. Right. So you're going to a different page or you're going to a uh, different parts on the page, um, things, things like that. 
that is a link. Right? So that you have to use it accordingly uh, to what they were meant to be used for. I, I still see um, some some sites that kind of use it interchangeably as if the, these two are the same thing. Um, but through the assistive technology, like through the uh, the screen reader, <clears throat> the screen readers users are used to using buttons that actually does something and they're used to hearing links that takes them somewhere. So if you start mixing up their behaviors, it will be a, a very confusing experience for, for, the, uh, for some of the users. And then you will have a, a select for your drop down menu. <clears throat> and then you have an input, uh, which is always used along with the a label. Uh, if you haven't done it, please use your input with the label. And then you have a detail and summary, which is also, again, uh, these two go to, uh, they're used as one. Um, and this is for your accordion uh, content. Right? And then we have a, <clears throat> a dialogue, uh, which is an easy way of doing your uh, a model components, right? So instead of doing, uh, instead of creating creating a uh, a div and then putting a position absolute, and then and then wiring a whole bunch of JavaScript functions to create your model, you can just now simply use a dialog element to create your model. Right. And then for the content, you know, we have a H1 through H6 for your headings. Uh, the headings actually do have a, a very specific usage and it ha has a, a rule on how it needs to be used. Um, back in the day, people used to use it because of the, the font size of of, of, um, of them, right? So like, you no, know, H1 is the largest and then it gets smaller as the, as the number gets bigger. But that, that's not how it should be used, right? So your headings, uh, so to the assistive technology users, what your headings does <clears throat> is it, it gives them a kind of like a table of contents uh, for them. Right? So they can just, um, just, so for on the screen readers, they have a, a shortcut key where they can just list out all the headings on the page. Right? So what that allows the the uh, screen reader users to do is they can just simply go through all the headings, and then see if there's uh see if the page contains the information that they are looking for, right? Just like how we go to a page and we kind of skim through the headings to see you know uh where I can find the content that I'm looking for, a similar behavior, right? Uh, on the screen reader, uh, on the for the screen reader users, right? So if your headings are not structured correctly or if your headings are, are not used correctly, you know, it will give a very weird, uh, weird looking table of content uh, for that. And then we have a regular P for paragraphs, um, strong for your bold, um, M for italics. Uh, we have a table for your tabular um, data, right? Um, Make, make sure your table is a table with the heading, right? Uh, every table needs to have a proper column or row heading. And we have an image <clears throat> with an alternative text. Uh, there are various, there, there are um, various different ways to provide alternative text. And on W3C website, they actually have a entire uh, entire decision tree that kind of helps you determine if you need it, if you need alternative text for your image and what type of alternative text you need for your image. Right? Um, and your iframe, like if you're embedding a YouTube video, your iframe needs to have a title to give it a name. And then uh, 
we have uh, a form, right? We got a form, we have the field set and the legend, uh, which is all part of the form. And then we have the uh, the list, the unordered list and then ordered list. Uh, <clears throat> right, so, so those are the content uh, related elements and they all have a, a meaning. Like I said, they all have a, a specific meaning and that is actually uh, uh announced by the uh screen reader right so uh when the screen reader user comes through an image it will <clears throat> it will read the alternative text in your image and, and through that alternative text the user understand what information that image is giving right uh <clears throat> same thing with the uh the form right when the user comes across the form, they know how to interact with it right? because they heard that it, it's it's a form, right? So they expect uh, the some type of input field, right? Whether it's a, a text input or a checkbox, radio button, right? So they are already aware of uh, of the form and what they need to do to uh, interact with it. <clears throat> um, kind of going back to the the landmark. The one good thing about the landmark is it helps the screen reader users uh navigate around the page uh page a lot easier, right? So screen readers have a lot of key commands, and one of the key commands is being able to navigate around the page uh via the landmark. So they can just jump from header to the main to the footer to the nav, right? They can just jump around different landmarks instead of uh, having to go through uh, line by line or every single uh, item on the page. Right? So that that's one one of the uh, I guess that's like the primary uh, purpose of the landmark is to help the assistive technology users navigate around the page a lot easier and then we have to uh have a and you we we have to have an accessible css right so your css also needs to be accessible and a lot of people don't really think that the css has any part in accessibility uh but it actually has um uh part of uh, uh, uh Part of a big impact on accessibility, right? And one of the uh, and one of the things that the CSS plays in uh, affects or CSS affects is the color contrast. So <clears throat> WCH actually has a minimum requirement for color contrast ratio, and it's a four point five to one. So the ratio between your foreground color. So uh, the text color of your button and then the background color of your button, that ratio needs to be at least 4.5 to 1, right? Um, I would suggest to aim a little bit higher, maybe like 5 or 6 to 1, because depending on the type of color blindness the user have, that 4.5 that 4.5 to 1 might still not be enough uh for them so they will lose that contract so if you aim a little bit higher um it will uh it will have a higher chance of that contrast uh maintain uh for like different color blindness uh uh for like for uh different color color blindness right so 4.5 4. is the minimum but try to aim a little bit higher than that. And responsive design, right? Uh, I, th I believe this is the, the first thing that is taught anywhere now, like even a boot camp or schools uh, that teach you about responsive design. But uh, why responsive design is important is, is, is to prevent your content from getting um, cut off or or, 
or obstructed by other content on different on smaller um screens right so because like, if your content gets cut off or it's, it's ob obstructed obviously you know it's 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 not only hard for us like uh, non-disabled people to even see to to even um to work with it's even harder for assistive technology users right um so that that that's why the responsive design uh is important uh for accessibility and to maintain the respon the responsive design of your site um it, it's better to use a relative units and and math to size your content or your component uh the pixels is actually quite hard unit so it's not very easy to make pixels uh responsive <clears throat> uh but if you if you use uh units like percent um m rem uh vh vw vw and etc uh those are much easier to work with uh to make your content accessible uh, and with the math is if you have a content or component that needs to be uh resized resized to a certain width or to a certain height based on you know uh other contents around you can use a calc function on the css to to achieve that and again all of this is to make your uh your site or even your application even more responsive to different um devices right and you please keep your focus outline right i still see many sites that uh removes the focus outline and that is uh <clears throat> that is a, a nightmare for users who cannot use a mouse all right so the keyboard users they need that focus outline <clears throat> to be able to tell whereabouts they are on the page so without that they um they will be completely lost and the chances chances of them returning to your site or your application is slim to none and <clears throat> use the uh painter for it as well right um for many years we relied on media query to make things uh responsive uh, you can still use media query, right? Uh, but if you add on the container query, it gives you more control to make it, make your um, make your site or application uh, more responsive. Right? And please include prefers reduced motion uh, media feature if you have any animations on your site or um, or on your application. Right. So what this allows is it allows the users to turn off the animations on your site. Um, and this is usually uh, detected if the user's operating system already have that turned off. Right. Um, so it does not require the user to do anything to turn off the animation on your site. Right. By, <clears throat> by you including this in your CSS, um the browser would detect uh if the user has the animation turned off on their operating system and it will automatically disable the animations and um execute the, whatever the styles that's inside this uh this media feature and this helps users like uh, with ADHD with ADHD who get uh distracted very easily with the with the moving parts or um uh or other uh other users who suffer or who has um the oh, I forget the word now but it's it's like um the user who who get motion sickness very easily that also helps them to by eliminating any any unnecessary movement or animation on the site, 
it helps those users who have like motion sickness uh related uh disabilities uh to you to still use your site and <clears throat> prefers color scheme right um uh, so again this is um uh, this allow okay this detects the op the user's operating system settings so i personally have my my uh, pc on uh, uh, windows uh on a dark theme right so whenever i go to a site that has the preferred color scheme they automatically switch to dark theme without me having to do anything so this helps users who are very sensitive to uh brightness right some users cannot uh look at a site with the uh the white background for too long because it gives them either a some type of uh either it gives them a, a migration like a headache or it uh makes their uh, eyes really tired so uh they cannot look at they cannot spend too much time on those sites so they prefer to have a dark theme right uh so this helps the uh the users again the users don't have to do anything because this will be automatically applied and last thing is please uh also test for high contrast right so on windows i'm not sure about mac on windows <clears throat> we have a, a light a dark and then there's a high contrast mode that's like really old style looking uh the black and um uh, it's got different colors for high contrast mode but when you get into the high contrast mode pretty much everything is like a black background um with the white text um and and depending on how your css re is written uh, some of the styles does get lost when the users are using the high contrast mode on their operating system. So um, that's just one more thing that you need to uh, check uh, uh, check for check uh, for your um, CSS. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so as a developer, testing is going to be part of your work as well, right? So when you're testing. Um, I usually do a two different testing. Um, I test with the screen reader and without the screen reader. And when I'm testing without the screen reader, I usually check for color contrast, keyboard support, uh, responsiveness, and being able to zoom to like up to two hundred percent. Right. So, and I will fix any issues that I find from this testing. And then I will do a, a second testing with the screen reader. And with the screen reader, I'm checking to see if things make sense, right? It, are things understandable to users? And if the keyboard support still works, right? So as I mentioned earlier, screen readers have a lot of key command, right? And if you have any a custom uh, shortcut implemented on your site or your application, you need to make sure that it does not interfere with the keyboard uh, key command, right? So uh, the keyboard support needs to be tested as well with the screen reader. Uh, <clears throat> and when you're testing, you no, know, it's always good to do more than one testing. So you need to have a different variations. So for example, you can test it on Windows uh, using a Chrome, using a screen reader or uh, Windows Firefox uh, uh, using a screen reader, right? Or it can be a Mac Safari screen reader or Mac Safari voiceover, so on and so forth, right? So <clears throat> do as many variations that you can, right? You don't have to do all of them, um, but obviously uh, the more variations you test for, uh, the more confident you will be to say that, you know, uh, my site or my application is accessible. <clears throat> so uh, the tools that I personally use, um, there are other tools available, but these are some of the tools that I personally use. Uh, <clears throat> I usually use the automated checkers first. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a good, quick way to get the list of issues that are present and help me understand you know uh 
what where the issues are coming from. So I use well, I list here. I don't use all of it. I use I kind of pick and choose uh, what I want to use. Uh, uh, the wave I don't use so much nowadays. Uh, it's a little bit weird. It's, it adds like extra markups or extra um extra like labels on your content. So it kind of it kind of uh, breaks the design of your site. Uh, so I don't really use Wave too often. Uh, my go-to is the X Dev tool, and uh, for color contrast, I usually use the uh, color contrast analyzer. So color contrast analyzer is actually a desktop application, um, and I believe this uh, you can use this on both Windows and Mac. And, and for the screen readers, there are, uh, you know, uh, different screen readers available. NVDA is a free screen reader. So I, I personally use NVDA. JAWS, you have to pay for it. You have to buy, uh, I think I think it costs you around $1,000 to buy the JAWS. And Windows Narrator is the Windows uh, default screen reader. Mac has a voiceover, Android has a talkback, and then iOS has a voiceover. <clears throat> um, ideally, you want to use more than one screen reader to test your uh, content or uh, your site because they are uh, different. The screen readers, like different screen reader readers, uh, are, are are slightly different, right? So each screen readers are slightly different from uh, each other. So like NVDA uh, and voiceover will say uh, some, like, will, will announce some elements a little bit differently, right? Same same thing with JAWS as well. So uh, yeah, ideally uh, you test it with uh, more than one screen reader. And I've been told, I, I, I don't know for sure because I don't own any um, Apple products, but I've been told that Mac voiceover is slightly different from iOS voiceover as well. So if you have the chance, I would test uh, on both as well. And that <clears throat> gives, uh, brings us to a, a, a demo. I don't know if we have, uh, uh, I don't know if we're gonna have a time because we have only 10 minutes left. But um, let me see if I can. <clears throat> so for the demo, I just have a form that I will try to demo. Uh, I'm not sure how the screen reader will uh, behave because when I'm in, when I'm presenting or when I'm sharing a screen, uh, the screen reader tends to behave a little bit strange. So let's uh, give that a shot. Taskbar, common common form markup. Does it, can everyone hear that? Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. Grouping out of grouping heading level one, register your cat. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do a quick demo, right? So cat information grouping, cat name star edit required blank, cat gender star grouping, male radio button checked required, cat color star combo box select a color collapsed required, owner information grouping, owner name star edit required blank, owner phone, optional, edit blank, Owner email star edit required blank. Register button. Please fill out this field. Right. Alert. So, Cat information. So this is like a a typical uh, form that you will see on on many in many um uh, sites, right? Uh, <clears throat> so the purpose of uh, a demo on on this form is to kind of show you that this form is not quite accessible, right? Because uh. First thing is, if you, I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, when I was on the owner phone field, it didn't tell me what the phone format needs to be, right? So as a screen reader user, uh, am I supposed to type with the hyphens in between or do I just type all numbers without the hyphen, right? There's really no way of, of me knowing 
what the phone number format needs to be. Right. And <clears throat> when I uh when I when I uh clicked on the register toolbar, cat information B. Register button. Please fill out this field. Alert. So that <clears throat> that tool tip that you see that come that's the default behavior when you get when you make the uh input required uh a field that is really not <clears throat> helpful to the users either because it doesn't really tell you uh i, I mean like in this example you know it doesn't really matter but for the uh for the input that requires like certain format of the of of the input it doesn't really tell you what the format needs to be and another thing is it disappears after a while. Right? So uh, there's really no way for the users to kind of go back and check you know, what exactly was wrong with, with the input they provided. Right? Um, <clears throat> so I have a more accessible form. So I have a more accessible form here. And um, so I'm going to go through and um, show you guys what the difference is, what, what, how different it sounds. Cat information grouping, cat name edit required blank, cat gender grouping, male radio button checked required, cat color combo box select a color collapsed required, owner information grouping, owner name edit required blank. So now, <clears throat> now listen to the, uh, uh, the owner phone field. Owner phone, optional. Edit phone format is 000-000-000 blank. Right, so it tells me it, it's three numbers, hyphen three numbers, hyphen four numbers. Right. So so I I don't have to guess what the phone number what what phone number format I need to provide. Owner email edit required blank. Register button. Fix these errors to continue heading level 2 list bullet cat's name is required visited link bullet select the color of cat visited link bullet owner's name is required link bullet owner's email is required. Right. So in this form I have a list of uh, issues, uh, right? a list of the errors right? that, that, uh, that, are, that exist on the form <clears throat> and these are a link so Cat's name is required. Select owner's name is required. So link. If I was to activate this link. Owner information it, it, grouping. It takes me directly to that field, so I don't have to kind of like go back and forth, you know, search through the form to find the field that was wrong, and uh, and and fix it, and then you know resubmit, right? So it kind of reduces the the amount of work that the user needs to uh user needs to do, right? And if they're not sure what other um, errors were, they can just simply go back. Fix these errors to continue heading level two. Right, because that's a heading um, that can easily just navigate backwards via the heading. And From then, Brandon Cha to everyone, and then, how lengthy should the in... And then uh, just uh, kind of go through the list of the errors and then fix a uh, uh, field by field, uh, fix one by one. And after everything's fixed, they submit and then you know uh, uh continue uh, continue with the rest of the process right so that was the um so another thing uh i want to show very quickly cat information l o y right. so if i was cat called bl owner information g n g g owner email edit e i a l m l so <clears throat> on this form email Register button. Let's say I was typing the email address and then, you know, I got uh, distracted. Uh, so I didn't finish my email address. Right? Fix these errors to continue heading level two list bullet owner's email format is incorrect. So it tells me that email uh, format is wrong. But if I was to go back Common to form the, if I was going, if I was to go back to the, uh, the previous form here, Cat info. Oh, what cat color owner? Oh, G -G owner. F email. F email. Register. Even though it says email format is incorrect, it didn't really announce that. And if I was to 
uh, click register, it will say it was successful. It still worked with the uh, wrong email format, right? Uh, owner information accessible for list with one owner in blank dot m <coughs> com register button. And with the with this uh, more accessible form, I fix the email format and I press uh, I click register. Registration for Hello Kitty was successful. My successful uh, message is also announced. So, uh, yeah, so a form, you know, uh, it, it really depends on how you provide the error uh, uh, messages and how you handle um, the form validation makes a difference to users who are using um, assistive technology. And exit. That concludes my talk for today <laughs> it was longer than expected um but yeah so if anyone have any questions i'll be awesome. yeah i'll be more than happy to answer your question awesome thank you so much hojan this was a very insightful presentation and i loved the demo as well uh we do have a couple of questions one from brandon and one from douglas uh, Brandon's asking how lengthy should the input be? Like how lengthy should the input be descriptive? Um, and can you put a custom description like a phone number and things like that? So like things like three number dashes um, or does it have to be in a different format itself? Yeah, so <clears throat> the length of uh, input description is, I guess, um, I wouldn't say too long, right? Make it, if you can make it as brief as possible, because the one thing with the uh, screen reader users is if things are too verbose, um, it gets really, it, it gets really annoying, right? Because um, they have to sit there and listen to the whole um, essay to exaggerate, like they have to sit there and listen to that essay. So make it as brief as possible. So for example, if you feel uh, is about phone number field, just give them a brief description of what the phone number format needs to be. Right? So you can say, like 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 how I had it, you know, you can say, you can have 000-000-0000, or you can even, uh, you can even do like uh, area code dash, you know, whatever that number is, right? Dash and the rest of the number, right? So uh, it, there's really no like fixed length that it needs to be, uh, but um, obviously try not to make it too long. Right. Awesome. And Douglas is asking, um... When I was at when I worked at WordPress a few years ago, I implemented some accessibility panel plugins that create small panels with some buttons to increase or decrease the font size, change color contrast, and a few other things. Um, he's asking, uh, are these kinds of panels helpful to users uh, when we develop applications, or are these panels more distractive and help? then help since uh, all user assistive tools uh, mention these within the accessibility uh, tools themselves. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> increasing and decreasing the font size can be helpful to, uh, to uh, users with the low vision. Right. But then Usually, their kind of go to behavior is just in, zoom in on the browser. Right? Or they most likely they are already using some sort of magnific, magnifier software. Right. So you can have it, doesn't hurt to have it. Right. Um, um, but uh, I would have, yeah, I would have said that they are a distraction of, of any sort. It just, it, it doesn't hurt to have it, but. You kind of have to understand that uh, if the user has a disability, they already have some sort of uh, 
software or device that helps them that they use on a daily basis, right? Um, uh, for for the color, <clears throat> for the uh the color contrast, uh, changing the color contrast, um, it's kind of hard to say, right? I mean, even if you were to change the color contrast, it may not appear the same to 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 the users with with the, with that with the um uh, the color blindness and it's also it's kind of i wouldn't say impossible but it, it's way too much work to cover all different types of color blindness right so <clears throat> i guess you know it would be better to just make sure that your um default colors have enough contrast so that uh, the user with the user users with the color blindness can still uh, see your content and see that distinguishing between contents and components uh, without needing to change the color contrast through your uh, the feature on the site awesome well If there are uh, no, no more questions, uh, I first want to thank everybody for coming out to tonight's session. Um, thank you, Hojan, for giving us this insightful presentation. Really loved it. And um, I've dropped a chat, uh, dropped links, a couple links in the chat uh, just to our Slack channel. If you want to join our Slack channel and you haven't already, feel free to do so. Uh, you can also find us on Meetup, LinkedIn, and our website as well. Uh, this session was recorded. And so we are also going to be uploading it to our YouTube channel, um, which is at Tech Tank. and uh, we will catch you in the next one. See everybody.